when I was flying around the world, I, I realized something. Someone said to me, did you know that there's 8 billion people on the planet and no one has circumnavigated the globe via air, sea and land? And I, I just sort of thought, that, that again, that was like that thing that got yeah. stuck in my mind. I was like thinking about it and I thought, well, that's funny. I've already cycled around the world, so there's your land and all being well. I mean, when I got back, I was yeah. like, okay, I've flown around the world, yeah. which actually can be quite complicated. Yeah. There's the le things that you have to have in place to fly around the world. And I kind of just sat there and I reflected a bit and I thought, how can I come this far and not sail around the world? Welcome back to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast, where we talk to the people leading the way in raising the profile of the ocean through research, exploration and advocacy. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to the first part of a two-part special of the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm joined by NOC Ambassador James Ketchell as he bids to become the first man to travel around the world by air, land and sea. So thank you for joining me, James. I should say thank you. For anyone who's not watching this episode, who's listening, we are on location. We're on James's boat in Gosport. Um, so yeah, I should say thank you for letting us join you on your boat. Well, thank you for having me. It's a great honour to be an ambassador. I, I can't wait to share this next journey. We'll talk about it and the sun is shining. We've got an right. awesome day to be on a boat, haven't we? Yeah, so the first, <laughs> so this part is going to be, so this is going to be a two-part special. The second part, we're going to talk in a bit more detail about the journey itself around the world, yeah. a bit about sort of the science you're going to be doing it and how, how you're going to be helping sort of Knox mission to, to educate people about the ocean, understand it. But I think in this part, we're going to talk a lot more about yourself, your past, and what has inspired you to take on this, this challenge. So should we start on a bit about your past and yeah. what, inspired you to become this adventure because you've done a hell of a lot in your life and oh, thank you. it'd be nice to sort of hear a bit it's more about that. It's all a bit that. of a blur now. Um, okay, so turning the clocks right back. When I was young, I never really had a great deal of confidence. Um, I always enjoyed being outside. I always liked going out and having, I was never someone that sat in and played computers or anything like that. And when I was young, I read about uh, two guys that rode across the Atlantic and that fascinated me this idea that you could row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. And that stayed with me uh, even when I was a teenager and even into my early 20s. But when I was young and even at school, I really struggled a lot. I didn't really have a great deal of drive. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was very lost and I worried about everything. I worried about what other people thought of me. And so that really held me back when I was younger. Then fast forward a few years, I had, um, sort of early sort of 20s i had a, a big motorbike accident and i broke my legs and that, i was in hospital for quite a long time um and it was a real reality check when i was lying in that hospital bed and the doctor said well you may be you might not be able to walk again but it was like it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it was like a light switch boom moment and i thought i know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna get better and I'm gonna row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. I have no idea how I'm going to do it, but I know what I want to do. And then I just started working towards that. And at the time I had a, a real job and I managed to convince them to give me some time off. And you know, it was, it was a quite a big project, but actually when I got out there, I realized something. I realized that it wasn't as hard as I thought it was gonna be. And all those years when I was young and I wanted to do it, but I didn't really believe in myself, or I didn't think it was possible, actually, it would have been completely possible. I mean, I can talk all day about being out in the ocean. I loved it, the wildlife. And every day when that sun comes up, the water glistens and sparkles in a different way. It's magical. Like being in the ocean is probably the best place you could ever be. I liked it. It might be some yeah. people's worst nightmare, but I loved it. And it was just incredible. Uh, but the, the thing that I took away from that was, you know what, actually you shouldn't really be afraid to try things that you've not done before. When you think something's gonna be difficult, it won't be as hard and, and you will be able to do it. And then it led on, like, and this is what I say to kids, like when you do something you've not done before, I guarantee you a door of opportunity will open. And that's kind of what happened after rowing across the Atlantic, that, door of opportunity opened I met someone who became a friend and then I had an invite out to climb Mount Everest and I didn't think in a million years I'd be able to do it but I recognized it was a good opportunity and I thought 
I'll regret it for the rest of my life if I don't take that opportunity. If I can get to the top, great. If I can't, at least I can look back and say that I tried. And then that sort of one thing led on to another and I had to leave my job to, to <laughs> climb Mount Everest. Um, and then I, I got very lucky. I stood on top of, of the world, which was physically the hardest thing I've ever done in yeah. my life. But again, it was amazing. But actually I was very poorly afterwards. I didn't know I had pneumonia. So I was descending Mount Everest with pneumonia, which put me in hospital. Yeah. And then again, I was lying in that hospital bed afterwards at a little bit of a crossroads. And I thought, where do I really want to go? What do I want to do? And after rowing across the Atlantic and then spending time out in the Himalayas and, and climbing Everest, I realized that going away and working on these projects made me feel alive. I felt happy, I felt content, and I felt like I was really living. And I thought, I don't know where this is gonna go, but I want to do more of this. And that's when I decided I was gonna cycle around the world. Yeah. And then I cycled around the world. I spoke in a school in every country I passed through. And then I was asked to, to do I've become an ambassador for the scouts and I was kind of doing all this stuff, speaking to schools, because I enjoyed doing it. Yeah. I loved it and I'm a big kid myself, so it kind of worked and I was able to connect with a young audience. And then before I know it, I'm sort of living a different life. I'm speaking at events and working on projects and stuff and I've never really looked back since. I call it job avoidance. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm good at that now. So, the, so yeah. yeah, so the, the, obviously you mentioned you did the road. Yeah. across the Atlantic first, then you did the Everest. So I'm guessing with Everest, you were, was that on your own or was that? No, you're, you, you're part of a team. Right. I was part of a small team um, climbing. And you know what, really, I just got very lucky standing on top. A lot of things need to go your way. I wasn't able to stand on top of the world because I'm some tough guy. I just, I got lucky. Um, I had very good weather window. I didn't have any problem with my equipment. I had a good team around me. and. You really, it's the Sherpas, the local people right. that live and work in the mountains. They're the real heroes that get you to the top yeah. and, and safely back down. Yeah. If it wasn't for them, no one would really be yeah. going out there doing anything. And actually, that's one of my favorite places. It's, uh, if you've never been to Nepal, it's a great place to go. The, the people are so kind and friendly and giving. It's just a wonderful place. A lot of the people don't have that much, but what they do have is this kind of kindness that I really like and uh, it's just a beautiful place yeah so, so that, I guess in the the road to the Atlantic so it's a very different challenge because totally, yeah. you're on your own the row in the Atlantic is completely in your yeah. head like complete it's not it, it, this may sound off but it's my opinion that rowing the Atlantic is not a physical challenge. Yeah. Now, some people would say, well, don't be daft. Of course it is. Yeah. But it's my opinion. It's all in the yeah. mind. You're sat on the seat and you're rowing all day, but you're not rowing at a hard pace. Like your heart rate's barely elevated. You're just tapping on the oars, making sure the boat's going the right way. And it's really more about enduring and surviving and thriving in yeah. the environment. You're in a tiny little boat, you're completely self-sufficient. And it's, it's just, you've got to, you've got to, trust me when I say you have to want to be there. Yeah. Because if you don't want to be there, it will, it will get on yeah. top of you and you, you, you know, yeah. it could be your, your worst nightmare. So I was going to say, before, before you take that on, how mentally did you prepare for something like that? Because you know you're going to be on your own for this long stretch of time. Is it something that you just have to, you, do, it's almost something, it? that's a very good question. It's almost something that you have to do. However, I would say I worked, I, I made that decision to row across the Atlantic in that hospital bed. I, it took a year to recover from that accident. And then it took me another year, just over another year to prepare to, to get the boat and get ready to go around the world. But I really wanted it like I've never wanted anything before. Yeah. And when you want something so badly that you become obsessed with it, yeah. you won't have a problem in your mind not doing it. Because remember, I chose to be there. I put myself there and I really wanted it. Yeah. And it was difficult making it happen. I had to raise the money. A lot of people weren't really... A lot of, a lot of people told me to grow up when I said I was going to row across the Atlantic. Um, but I kind of didn't really let that put me off. And then I was raising money for a charity that look after poorly children. Yeah. And the people that did give me support, I didn't want to let them down. So whilst usually when you row across an ocean, you do it as a two man team, a four man team. And I wanted to do it with someone else, but no one would do it with right. me. So I, I had no choice but to do it on my own basically. Yeah. 
but I think it was probably the best decision I, I ever made. And whilst I was physically on my own, I wasn't in, in my mind. I wasn't on my own. I had the responsibility of yeah. other people that were following me. I was yeah. raising money for a charity that looked after poorly kids. And I said, I never forget. I said to my parents, I will never give up. If the boat sinks, yeah. I'll get in the life raft. <laughs> and, and just tr tr yeah. keep going. I, I, I wanted it like I'd never wanted anything yeah. else. And when you want something that much, it, it will come together. You'll get it. Yeah. But you've, you've got to want it. So I didn't really have a problem. And when I was out there, you have ups and downs. What, what really shapes the way you feel or determines how you feel is your progress towards your goal. Yeah. So when you're out in an ocean and you're rowing somewhere, across the Atlantic, when you're making good progress towards that goal, it's the best place you could ever be. But as soon as those winds turn and you're getting blown backwards and there's nothing you can do, because remember, yeah. it's all out of your control, yeah. basically. You can't control the weather. It's, it's quite a tough place to be. But I realized after a while that things never stay the same. One minute you're getting blown backwards, um, but it never takes long for that yeah. wind to change and off you go again. So I learned to sort of what I call stay on an even keel. Don't get too down when I'm going backwards or it's not, yeah. I'm not having the best of days because tomorrow's a new day and you yeah. don't know what the wind's going to bring and what's going to happen. And I, I kind of learned, and everything is temporary. Like it's going gonna, it's gonna to end at some point. And what really helped me when I was rowing across the Atlantic is having something to aim for. So I would spend a lot of time thinking in great detail about all the things I'm going to do when I finished all the people I'm going to see, things I want to learn, things I want to do. And so I had something that I was rowing towards, if that makes yeah. sense. And what actually happens is when you kind of get to the halfway point, you're then by default closer to where you want to be than where you started from. And all of a sudden you start to think, hang about, I'm going to do this. I'm really going to do this. It's going to happen. I just have to keep going. And I got, I got progressively stronger and fitter and more motivated the closer I got. And it was really interesting. I was 24 hours from Antigua. Um, you, can't, you can't see the island. Right. And people said to me, who'd already rode the Atlantic, they said, oh, you can see Antigua 60 miles out. Yeah. That's rubbish. If you're on top of the QE2, you might be able to. Right. But when you're one or two feet above the water, like the horizon is really not that far <laughs> away. And so I think I was about 25 miles out, something like that. And it was at night and I could see this red beacon flashing on top of a radio mast. Yeah. I knew it was Antigua because I could see it on the chart plotter. And I had this radio, I tuned it in and, and I could hear this like reggae, reggae music playing. <laughs> it was like Caribbean music. And I was like, I've done it. You made I've rode it, across yeah. it. And something really interesting happened. When I got to that point, I didn't want it to end. I didn't want it to end. Yeah. I was like, oh, I, I want to carry on. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy. And I think another thing that I took away from rowing across the Atlantic is try whatever it is you're doing, try to enjoy the process of doing it yeah. and enjoy the journey. And if you can do that, the whole experience and when you do finish will be just that little yeah. bit better because I, I had this mentality that I've got to get to Antigua. I've, I was rowing really hard and sometimes I didn't stop to take photos or to take it in and think, yeah. wow, look at that. Look at that bird that's yeah. just sat there on the boat or look at that incredible whale that's yeah. just swam past. Because you can see that the wildlife's amazing, by the way. It's an abundance of wildlife. Yeah. When you look over, the water was crystal clear. It was incredible. But sometimes I never stopped to take pictures or film it because yeah. I felt like I was in too much yeah. of a rush. Yeah. And when I look back, that was a mistake. I should have, yeah. I should have taken my time yeah. a bit more. I think it's like with everything yeah. in life, like even the small things that people do every day, yeah. you, care, you take, put so much time into planning something, yeah. you think about so much what's happening, and then once it actually happens, it's almost like, oh, it's, it's over really quickly. Yeah. It's like you said, when you, when you got to Antigua and you're like, oh, I want this to carry on, I think, yeah, a lot of it, that sort of panic and, and work that goes in before is almost inconsequential compared to what happens when you're out there. But obviously that's, that row in the Atlantic obviously put you in great stead for being set on this journey yeah. to where we are today. Yeah, yeah. gave me more confidence. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned cycling around the world. So you cy did you cycle around the world first before you flew around the world? Yeah, yeah. I cycled around the world in 2013 and right. I finished in 2014. Yeah. It took half a year to get around the world. Man, that was amazing. Yeah. I'd do it again if yeah. I could. The people I was meeting 
like, like the kindness and generosity that was bestowed on me when I went around the world. I'll, I'll be passing forward favours for the rest of my yeah. life. And I met loads of different people and experienced loads of different places. And it was just magical. And I was benefiting from the benefits of exercising every day. So a lot of people would say, you must have been very tired cycling 100 miles a day. Yeah. But it was the opposite. I had so much energy and yeah. drive. I would jump out of bed in the morning. I felt amazing. And if you've not had a very good day, go and ride your bike 100 miles. You will feel amazing afterwards. Yeah. I know that's a bit of an extreme yeah. thing to say, <laughs> but I, I just loved it. Yeah. And the scenery was changing yeah. every few days. And it was, I stayed with lots of different people. Yeah. And when I was in America, cycling across America, I stayed with a family and they knew a family a hundred miles further on, which is where I was going. Yeah. I stayed with them. Yeah. They then knew a family in the next town. And I literally piggybacked across America, staying yeah. with different people. And it was, it was awesome. So what was the route? Was it? Yeah. So I started from Greenwich Park right. uh, up in London, uh, cycled down uh, to Dover, got on a ferry and went across to France and then cycled through Northern France, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey. I actually had to fly from Turkey into India because I couldn't get through Iran right. uh, and Pakistan. And then from there, I cycled down uh, down to Sri Lanka. I cycled a yeah. lap of Sri Lanka. It's a little island right. just south of India. Then from there, I flew to Bangkok and then came down. I cycled down through yeah. Thailand, Malaysia. Then from Singapore, I flew to Perth in Western Australia. And then I cycled across the famous Nullarbor, uh, which is basically like the outback. Yeah. And it's really interesting. A lot of people said to me, that's crazy. It's very dangerous to cycle across that road. And uh, actually it wasn't, it was, it was fantastic. It, it was a real feeling of like camaraderie when you're crossing this, yeah. the desert and people would stop and say, oh, are you okay? Do you need anything? Do you want any water or food? Do you want a lift? <laughs> I said, well, that defeats the object <laughs> yeah. of what I'm trying to do. But That's I appreciate cheap, that. Bit, yeah. And it was really interesting. I'll tell you something. All the people that had never been to Australia, they'd never crossed the Nullarbor, told me, don't go there. It's very dangerous. You're nuts. Right. Actually, when I got there, it was a complete opposite. It was amazing. Yeah. And it kind of made me realize, think about who you listen yeah. to. Think about who you yeah. take advice from. Yeah. Have they done what it is that you want yeah. to do? You know? So that was, Australia was amazing. And it was just starting to get really hot when I left. And then I finished in Brisbane. So I went the whole right. way across, then up to Brisbane. Yeah. Then I flew to San Francisco, then cycled uh, down to LA, then San Diego, right. and then out uh, to Miami, the other side. And then from Miami, I hopped onto a plane and flew to Lisbon. Then Lisbon, I cycled back up to London and that's it. That's yeah. 18,000 miles right. around the world. And that's all, you, if you want to say you've cycled around the world, <laughs> yeah. you, all you have to do is cycle yeah. 18,000 miles and um, cross the equator twice yeah. and cycle in either an east or a westerly yeah. direction. And, that, and that's it. So. Yeah, it's amazing. So you can see you cycle around the world, but you can also say that you've flown around the world as well. Yeah. Um, how was that different? I mean, when you finished that cycle, did you think, I want to do this again, but fly? Or was it just something that kind of well, happened? I have always had an interest in flying, actually, ever since I was a kid. But when I was young, I. I didn't really have a great deal of confidence in myself. I thought that flying was for people that were very intelligent, yeah. had lots of money, and I kind of fell short on both those. But then I was a little bit older and I thought, well, I've done a few things, so why can't I learn how to fly? And actually my interest initially was helicopters, right? but I just simply couldn't afford to fly yeah. helicopters. It was just too expensive. And I learned about gyrocopters, uh, which kind of look like helicopters, but they work in a different way, yeah. basically. Um, they're more of a plane actually than a, than a helicopter. The rotors aren't powered. Anyway, I, I learned how to fly and surprisingly it was much easier than I thought it was going to yeah. be. I thought it was going to be really difficult. Yeah. It I was, really, was going to say, really you know, the saying that it's easy as riding a bike, but obviously flying <laughs> a, hel a plane like that is, yeah. you must've had to learn a hell of a lot to be able to do that. Do you know what? In the beginning, you, know, you, you do have to learn quite a lot and it's very easy to, for it to be quite overwhelming, but I kind of like just broke it down. And I just took one lesson at a time. And I think when I was young, I, uh, younger, I used to race motorbikes, hence the, the yeah. motorbike accident. So I guess I had an element of co a good coordination yeah. and balance. And I think that stood me in good stead. 
and also don't again i wanted it i really wanted yeah. to learn how to fly and when you really want something you're gonna make effort yeah and it, it, it wasn't that difficult i picked it up quite quickly I passed, uh, actually, I got my license with, if, with literally, there's a minimum amount of hours that you have to fly. And I think I was only one or two hours over the minimum that you have to fly. I was just fortunate, picked it up quite quick. And then I realized that actually there's been a few attempts, but no one's flown one of these around the world. And it, it, you know, I never woke up one day and thought, I'm gonna do all these different things. In all honesty, as one door closes, two or three doors typically always open. And I thought, okay, I have no idea if I'm going to do this, but I'm going to go after yeah. this. And again, a lot of people said to me, you're out of your mind. How, do, how are you going to fly yeah. this thing around the world? But I kind of broke it down and thought, well, if I fly just one flight a day in the same way that I cycled, just cycled one day, I stopped and then I started again the next day. If I just take that approach and be like, well, just, just, yeah. just link these days together. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. Why can't I get around the world? And so I set off in 2019. Yeah, flew into Europe, then flew the whole way across Russia, across the Bering Straits into America, into Canada, then uh, down into America, flew across America, and then flew up uh, back up into Canada. Then I flew across the Davis Strait um, uh, to Greenland. Then to Greenland, I flew to Iceland. Then Iceland, I flew to the Faroe Islands. Then the Faroe Islands, I flew back to Popham, Basingstoke, where I started and finished. Yeah. And that's it, after just taking it one day at a time, and six months later, I'd, I'd flown around the world yeah. and set a Guinness World Record. And here's the interesting thing. Everything I worried about before I left never happened. Right. It, it, and it was, again, it was incredible. Yeah. I, I spoke in a school in every country I part. I even spoke in a school in Siberia, and we had, uh, I had a translator. Yeah. And I was talking to these kids and I don't really, I don't know what he was saying. They were laughing all the time, mm. the kids. So I, one would hope he was translating what I was saying. But, uh, you know, what made me, what really opened my eyes up is there I was in Siberia talking to kids who are a translator. They speak Russian. They probably never met a, a, a crazy guy from England before. But they were asking all the same questions that kids ask me in this country. And it kind of made me realise it doesn't really matter where you live or what language yeah. we speak. Human beings are ultimately all the same. Yeah. Same kind of interests, same kind of things yeah. on their mind. They'll ask you the same things. And it was amazing. And I mean, I'll never see those kids again, but I hope they remember the day that that yeah. lunatic came in and was, was sort of <laughs> sharing stories with them. And that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess all that leads to today. So yeah. for a few months off, you're setting sail here in Gosport. Uh, around the world. Do you want to tell us a bit, maybe a bit about why you, you're doing it? And then there's a bit about the boat as well. Obviously in part two, we're going to talk more about, yeah. in more detail about the journey itself and what's going to be happening on that journey and where you'll be going. But do you want to just give us a bit of sort of background on why yeah. you're doing it, a bit about the boat and, and, and maybe sort of what, what challenges? Because obviously you've had experience being on the ocean, yeah, but not quite what you're going to be doing. Yeah, okay, so when I was flying around the world, I, I realized something. Someone said to me, did you know that there's 8 billion people on the planet and no one has circumnavigated the globe via air, sea, and land? And I, I just sort of thought that, that, again, that was like that thing that got yeah. stuck in my mind. I was like thinking about it and I thought, well, that's funny. I've already cycled around the world, so there's your land and all being well. I mean, when I got back, I was yeah. like, okay, I've flown around the world, yeah. which actually can be quite complicated. Yeah. There's the le things that you have to have in place to fly around the world. And I kind of just sat there and I reflected a bit and I thought, how can I come this far and not sail around the world? I just doesn't, I don't really know what I'm going to do after yeah. this. But it was that classic, there's a door opening and I think there's potentially yeah. something really good the other yeah. side of that. So five years ago, I made the decision that I was going to sail around the world. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to also keep that theme going of working with young people. It doesn't really matter about the, the first person to circumnavigate yeah. by air, sea and land. Yeah. I thought it was quite cool. But I thought, well, hang about, this could be a really good opportunity. I don't need to race around the world. I don't necessarily need to sail nonstop. 
it would make it very difficult. So I thought, well, if I sail around the world and I stop at different places, I could break it down because breaking things down makes it more manageable. I could go and visit some schools in the local communities and share my stories and share the things I've learned with kids. I talk a lot to kids, you know, about the importance of trying new things, having a good attitude, not being afraid to ask for help, taking ownership of things, understanding what you control, what you can't. And all the life lessons that I've learned, I try to share with kids. Yeah. And so I thought, well, that's going to be pretty cool. I can do that. And then also right behind your head, you can see the Starlink here. And that gives me full broadband internet on the boat. And I thought, well, as I go around the world, we've got a really cool opportunity to share the geography yeah. of going around the world, the science of, of how the weather works, the science of the ocean and the importance of understanding it and, and protecting it and things. And the more and more I thought about going around the world, sailing around the world, the more I thought this has, I have to do yeah. this. So I guess, yeah, fast forward some time when we sat on the boat, I have a, a class 40, so it's a 40 foot yeah. boat and I'm sailing on my own. Uh, and this boat's designed for, for single handed sailing, which means sailing it on your own. And it's a good solid boat to take around the world. It, it has the performance if I need to, to sail quickly, but it's also a very strong, solid boat, which will, all I've got to do is stay in this boat. Yeah. And in theory, Hopefully it should get me around the world, yeah. but I'm sailing quite conservatively. I'm not pushing this boat um, because I have to get around the world. If I don't finish, it's, that's yeah. no good. Yeah. So it's more of a marathon uh, than a sprint. And I think, you know, I've been on a lot of different journeys and I've had a lot of ups and downs. I've, I've had things go well. I've had things not go so well. I was rescued in the Indian Ocean uh, in 2015 when a boat I was on capsized. Right. So I've experienced highs and I've experienced lows, as, as has everyone who's, yeah. I, you know, at, at some point. But actually getting to where we are now has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to, 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 to kind of do. Um, it's been particularly difficult raising all the funding yeah. to, to, to get this boat and put things in place. Uh, that's been really hard. Yeah. I mean, I've, I'm almost there because we're sat here. Yeah. So I'm almost looking forward to going to have a rest, which, yes. which sounds kind of crazy. But obviously there's the science yeah. that we're doing, yeah. which we can talk yeah. about, which I'm super excited for. And I see it as a real honor and a privilege to be able to represent, yeah. you know, NARC and especially with the Argo float program to yeah. deploy some floats in the Indian Ocean and Pacific. That's, that's just awesome. Yeah. And I just, you know, I just hope the project, it, I, yeah, I mean, we've kind of, kind of come, come to this idea, but I, I called it Project Inspire because I was hoping that perhaps this journey might inspire other young people or anyone really to, to, to undertake a dream of their own. It doesn't have to be a journey. It doesn't have to be an adventure. But life is good when you go after stuff. Yeah. You set a goal. You have purpose. Yeah. And you have something that's important to you that yeah. you're going after. And I, I want to try and instill that in young people. Definitely. So, and that tees yeah. us up perfectly for part two. <laughs> um, so in part two, you're going to be joined by one of an one of scientist, Dr. Yes. Venmo, and you're going to talk a bit more about the journey itself, maybe some of the challenges of the ocean might yeah. throw at you, as well as, as you mentioned, the Argo, Argo yeah. program, which we'll mention as yeah. well. But um, thank you so much for joining oh. me today, James. It's an amazing story, an amazing story, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank, thank you for having and, me. And um, yeah, we'll see you in part two. 100%. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the podcast. To ensure you don't miss out on future episodes, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next time.